Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that the first thing you have to endure so early in the morning is a presentation in another language. Um, I understand it's traditional um, in Finland to make a joke about the weather. Um, uh, I've come from a very similar situation in England, and in fact we took, a, uh, took the chief executive of our environment agency for the whole country out a few, a few weeks ago. And I live in the very far northwest of England, near the Lake District, uh, before you get into Scotland. And he arrived in the sunshine in just a light jacket. In ten minutes it was snowing. In another five minutes it was raining. And in about another hour the sun was back and he happily got back into his car and went back to London, we've never seen him since. <laughs> um, anyway, the presentation I've been asked to give is about um, how Rivers Trusts are involving citizens and communities in, um, in, in, in addressing dams and barriers to fish migration. Um, it's been a big piece of our work now for a good 10 years. Um, I work for the Rivers Trust, which is an NGO, um, and we are an umbrella body for all of the local groups of people who get involved and restore rivers. Um, I just wanted to let, sort of talk a little bit about what is the Rivers Trust. And I'm a great believer that wherever you are in the world, and I've had the great pleasure of working in lots of different countries, wherever there are rivers, wherever there are lakes, wherever there's the sea, wherever there's fish, wherever there's canoeing, or other activities, people want to get involved. And if you give them half a chance, they will mobilize to do improvements. Um, sometimes they might be the wrong kind of improvements, but the energy is there and the will is there to do something. And that is what we try to capture in Rivers Trusts. And we ha capture it, we foster it, we facilitate it, we make it stronger, uh, and we make sure that it delivers stuff that's in, for benefits of all of society. Um, there's a few things that are unique about the way that we've set this up. Um, there's lots of community groups out there. There's lots of fishing clubs that do work. Um, there's lots of charities and NGOs that do environmental and conservation work. Um, there's a few things that make us strong in the way we do things. Um, one of those is that we make sure all of our groups are incorporated as companies, as legal That's really important. It means they can enter into contracts, they can employ people. It means that when they're working with their government agencies, it, they are taking on a, the same responsibility and the same legal responsibility as the government agency is. Um, we're also registered as charities in the UK, which means we're free of corporate taxes, which is another benefit. Um, we don't campaign. There's lots and lots of organisations that do great campaigning, and we work very closely with WWF in the UK. Um, there is no need for us to do that. We concentrate on delivery and just doing work on the ground. That's where the gap seems to be in the UK. Um, and everything we do is about the river. We're not, we're not worried about other types of conservation or environment unless they impact on the river. And that means that every piece of money that someone gives to us is always going into watershed improvement. Um, and the other thing that's really unique is, is the situation that we have to work in. Um, because we're working on rivers and because we're working on watersheds, we work across the whole landscape scale and we deliver on other people's land because you know, most land in the UK is in private ownership. So we can't buy up our rivers or put fences around them or create reserves that protect them. We have to persuade other people to do that for us. So why do people do this? Why do people go out there and form these these, these groups uh, and all the work that goes with it. And my first involvement was, was right down here in the, in the, in the bottom southwest of the country, in the middle of the BSE crisis. Do you remember that? The mad cow disease. And the uh, rivers were uh, getting worse. The fishermen were up in arms. They were blaming the farmers. The farmers were blaming everybody else. Um, and because of this problem, the incomes to farms had dropped very low. And so the, the environmental damage was getting worse. So uh, uh, we started working there to form a group that was trying to work with farmers to change the way they did things, making sure that they understood that doing things which were good for the environment was also good for their economy. Uh, and it was very successful. Um, uh, another one uh, which formed around the same period was right, couldn't be more opposite, in the middle of London, Thames 21, where we had a gap in our legislation in that if, if literal rubbish got into water, it was no one's responsibility. So we formed a charity to, to deal with that problem. Um, 
For the River Wye on the Welsh border, uh, there was a 90% collapse in the salmon population. And that was another drive that made communities say, we really need to do something. That's a big change. Uh, Northern Ireland, uh, a very special kind of fish, occupies a lake called Loch Ness. Uh, it's unique to that lake, and it was disappearing fast. And fishermen from all around the lake got together to form a charity to, to save this particular fish. Um, the River Eden, another river trust that I worked for, um, a pollution event from a farm killed 80 miles of the river. And there's nothing like your river dying you know, in front of your eyes. You're seeing dead fish floating, but people just want to get involved and do something. Um, and the River Tyne, right up in the northeast here. Um, the Transport Authority wanted to build a new tunnel across the river. And instead of going underneath it, they wanted to build a trough through it. Uh, and it's the, it's the most important salmon river in, um, in England. Uh, and so a trust was formed to, uh, to deal with the impacts of that potential tunnel construction. So what do they do? They do all sorts of things, and it depends on what those communities are interested in. Everything from river cleanups, they monitor water quality, they uh, carry out habitat improvements in urban areas. Um, they deal with non-native invasive species. Um, they get involved in land management and farming, which is probably one of the most important areas of our work. Um, and of course, we remove dams. <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> More like that. Um, we are riddled with thousands and thousands of dams across the country, which, um, you know, it doesn't matter how big they are, they cause huge problems both for geomorphology and, um, of course, for, for migratory species of fish. Um, the growth of the Rivers Trust movement has been really interesting. We, those of us who've worked for it feel like we've had a tiger by the tail. It's been extraordinary. We, we started off in the, in the early 80s with just, a, you know, one or two trusts. Um, by 2004, we had enough to form an association where we got together and realised we could share some, some knowledge. Um, that very quickly led to the government becoming interested in us because they had one point of contact to talk to for the whole country. Um, and in 2009, we were very lucky that they, they gave us a chance to deliver some of these big projects, removing dams and barriers to fish migration, to help meet the second cycle of Water Framework Directive. Um, at the end of the first cycle of Water Framework Directive, WWF and the Anglers, uh, the association that represents fishermen, um, they took the government to court over failure to, delivery, to de deliver the Water Framework Directive. And part of the settlement was that they would invest more money in communities to deliver work. Um, it's probably quite hard for you to see the figures that are up there, but in the first year, we just got a, a little bit of money and we started you know, empowering communities to do this work. We, we, we helped them with the project management, but they delivered all of the construction work. Um, by the end of three years, we delivered, we've been given um, just under £6 million sterling from the government. Um, and we've actually delivered over £8.5 million pounds worth of down removal work. So far more than they actually gave us money for. Because when communities start delivering work, other people start contributing. And if you're a group of people trying to do something in your community, there's always someone with a digger. There's always someone who knows someone, who knows someone who's got the right piece of equipment you need to finish the job, and that will often come very free or you know, cheap or, or, or free. So that was a really big part of the growth of our organisation, and it really made government realise that they could deliver a lot more with the help of, of citizens doing work. Um, and that's really culminated in um, 2013 with the launch of something called the catchment-based approach. And that's actually um, set forward a process where, where each watershed in the country, um, uh, the communities that, would, that live there can apply to be the lead for managing that particular uh, catchment plan. Coming up with a catchment management plan that contributes to the Water Framework Directive River Basin Plan. And we're still very much in the early years as to training our communities as to how to deliver that work. But I think it's, it, you know, it offers some very exciting opportunities in the future for delivering um, lots of things locally uh, and contributing to national, national policy in a very affordable way. Um, I wanted to illustrate why communities can deliver some things where government can't 
with a couple of pictures of a gun removal project. Um, this particular site here uh, was subject to a very, very bad flood in the 1960s, which, which killed people in a town downstream of here. Um, there used to be a bridge here, and that bridge was washed out, and as an emergency repair was done, where they built a dam across with a couple of pipes in it, so people could access the village uh, the other side. Um, 40 years later, it was still there. Uh, an old stream of here was prime, prime um, uh, salmon spawning areas, um, but it's also built up with lots and lots and lots of gravel and so on, which can't move down, and downstream is you know, starved of gravel, it's, it's worn away, it's bedrock. Um, so the estimate of the bridge here was um, over a million pounds, and there was no way that that was ever going to be budgeted. So every year the plan came out for the salmon for this particular river, and there was always, we must put a bridge here, but there was never any money to come available. And in the context of you know, having to find money for hospitals, for schools, for other community projects, there was never going to be a project, you know, there was never going to be a bridge here. So the local rivers trust got together with all of the different authorities and all of the uh, different stakeholders that came up with an alternative solution. Um, and we've been using these oversized box culverts quite a lot um, as a, a, a interim uh, measure, which is much, much more affordable. Um, they might look like a bridge, uh, and they might act like a bridge, but according to the law, they're not a bridge. <laughs> so um, we, can get, we can get them in much cheaper, we can get them all the right loadings for vehicles to get over them and so on. Um, and suddenly a million pound bridge became a 100,000 bridge. Um, and the project, which would never have ever happened, you know, has now happened and it's opened you know, off over 20 kilometres of prime salmon spawning area in a river where salmon is a conservation issue. So the scale of growth, I said, has been incredible. We've now got over 50 independent trusts covering the whole of England, Wales, and we're now growing in Ireland as well. Um, last year, we did, delivered over £20 million worth of work, and we now employ over 220 professionals locally. And sometimes these are quite remote locations, and they're, they're employing postgraduate people, uh, young people who have got a lot of skills in very rural communities, where traditionally we've had a lot of loss of those kind of skills. So they've actually become very important local employers as well. And this is in a period where most of the government agencies are moving to bigger cities and downscaling their size and so on. So, so we're kind of reversing that, that trend there. So just looking at the scale of the problem we have with barriers um, in the UK, I mean, I'll just throw up a few maps here, um, but it, you know, it, it does obviously look like the, um, the country has got measles. Um, the map on the left is uh, an assessment to try and find all of the barriers uh, using radar from the sky. Um, and the map on the right is one which has been ground roofed, um, but we did as part of a European project with um, with, with people in the Netherlands and Denmark. Um, but it really is vast. You know, I think we've estimated that there's over 4,500 priority barriers that need to be addressed within the Water Framework Directive by 2027. And we've probably only got enough money for 400. You know, that's the sort of the scale uh, of the problem. So anywhere where communities can contribute additional work, do extra, is, is going to be positive and a benefit. Um, and we do a lot of work in the National Umbrella Group to, to try and um, uh, educate our local groups on where the priorities are. So we use a lot of online geographical information system tools. Um, this is one example which, which shows where the government agencies have highlighted the critical and the supercritical barriers. Uh, and then there's also a heat map showing where the density is very high of barriers. And you can zoom in on this map and see each individual one with a photograph and you know, what needs to be done there to address it. Uh, and in many ways, that's all people need, is just to know where they are. Um, but if I can give an example of one river which you know, doesn't ex even exist on the, on the mapping at all, where the, the local community went out and surveyed the river, they found 18 dams that had never been recorded before, all left over from various problems that no one would ever, no one could even remember why they were put in. So how do communities finance all of this? I mean, I've just told you how, you know, Finances are hard, we've only got enough money for 400. Um, we're not going to be able to deliver very much within water frame collective. So how are communities finding additional money to, to deliver this? Um, 
And there's some various drivers that, that we're trying to pull together to sort of create an integrated landscape, I suppose, an integrated place where we can, where we can combine this work. Um, we've got drivers under the eel regulation, which you, I guess you do too. Um, we've got something called the Salmon Five Point Approach. We've had a really strong decline in salmon in the UK in the last few years, and the government agencies have got together with the NGOs and created, created a Five Point Approach, which doesn't have any money attached to it at all. It's just a concept where, where we're going to work together uh, to deliver more. Um, we've got obviously the drivers within the Water Framework Directive. We've got drivers within Nature 2000 and the Habitats Directive. Um, and we've also got flood risk reduction, which is quite an important for one for us at the moment, where many of these dams could actually be contributing to flood risk. If we can identify that, we can find some money to remove them. Um, and the sorts of money that we're managing to access is um, European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, Article 38 and 41, I think, of that particular piece of legislation. And that's money that's never gone to freshwater work before in the UK. Um, we've got budgets from the Environment Agency, from water companies, and from our national lottery, surprisingly, have been contributing to, to these projects. Um, because citizens and communities involved, they can often find money from private companies. Um, but I suppose the scary thing about this slide for me, uh, from the UK, is you know, we also have big contributions in there from LIFE, from ESIF, from the ERDP. Um, and we're not going to have those for very much longer. So that, that's really quite frightening for us. Um, and I should mention, you know, there are a few things that do stop communities in develop, uh, delivering this work. Um, one is heritage, um, and aesthetics, I suppose, with that as well, is that we have lots and lots of weirs which people have grown to love over the years and they find attractive, or they, you know, they're interested in the heritage value of it. Uh, and so it's very difficult for us to, to remove some of those. This is a particular problem here, actually, um, on the River Eden, which is one of our highest SAC, uh, near Jura 2000 rivers in the whole country. And still we can't remove a weir because people like it. Um, engineers. Um, engineers love engineered solutions. And they're frightened about the uncertainty that comes with removing dams. Uh, no matter how little they are. Um, and sometimes, you know, engineers will want to deliver a project that costs three times the amount to take fish around something that you could remove and then have no maintenance worries about forever. Um, but, you know, it's a big challenge for us is to increase the evidence base that dam removal is not as scary as people think. Geomorphology, on the other hand, though, is a problem and it's something that we have to be very considerate of. We lost an awful lot of bridges in the last floods we had. And if we, if we start removing more dams in river systems, we have to acknowledge we're going to have movement of gravel, we're going to have movement of rivers. And we need to give rivers space, and there is going to be some work needed on our infrastructure to allow it. Um, so that, you know, that is a big consideration we've had to train communities in, because the last thing we want is someone going out, taking out a weir, flooding someone's house, or losing a bridge, and then us you know, having a stop on it over the whole country. Um, and the last thing, and perhaps the most controversial, is hydropower. Um, is we had some very strong, um, uh, strong incentives to implement hydropower projects, but instead of a, uh, a strategic view being taken, uh, a very opportunistic one was. So everybody went out and tried to find all of the, you know, the weirs that were redundant that we wanted to remove, and they sort of highlighted them for hydropower development. Um, and uh, so that, that is a really big challenge for us, trying to show that, you know, in many of these instances, the value of the energy you're getting from these things is not really um, uh, making up for the, the existence of the structure. So I'll just run through a couple of case studies. Um, uh, starting with the most grand, um, we've just uh, launched a big project with, with our, one of our member trusts, Seven Rivers Trust. This is um, uh, England, well, the UK's longest river um, and um, this is the largest dam removal project that we're aware of in, in UK history. It's, um, uh, it's 19.4 million pounds sterling, so over 20 million euros. Um, it's a contribution from our national lottery and from the, the LIFE program again. Um, and it's over five years and rather than it being one 
single dam removal. It's a removal of dams all the way up through the Severn system to allow, in particular, Ali Shad and Twait Shad, Alosa, Alosa. Are you familiar with, with those species? Um, they've quite high conservation value in the UK for, to allow them to migrate again. And the result from this piece of work, um, according, from the life programme's perspective, is we have a commitment from UK government that once those areas are opened and the shad return, then they will designate the river as a nature of 2000 site, uh, which would be an incredible um, victory for us to be able to do that. Um, I want to run through this case example because it also shows some of the challenges, challenges that we have. Um, that's a sort of typical sort of large, large uh, weir or dam that was put in to feed water to a mill. Um, and that mill then became a fish farm. Um, and we went into partnership here with, with the government agency and with the local anglers. And the anglers managed to raise enough money to, um, to buy out the license for the fish farm. Um, uh, that was quite, quite a big deal that the fish farmer wasn't making a lot of money and he wants to retire anyway. So it was an opportunity that we, we really needed to make the most of. Um, but what you can't see on this picture, and I don't know whether there's a pointer on here, I think there is, yeah. Uh, what you can't see on this picture is there is a road that just runs across here. So we had to remove this, this dam whilst making sure the engineers were happy that we weren't going to wash the road away. So um, we had to do, you know, basically a partial removal and then create a, a rock ramp that goes over the top of it, sort of a semi-natural stretch of river. And we have to do these in an awful lot, so we, we hate doing it really, because we'd rather just remove the whole thing and let nature take its course. But in this case, um, it was very important that we protected the road. Um, and that's what the finished result looks like. It's not the prettiest, but I think that, you know, that sort of shows the constraints that we have probably in a lot of Europe, you know, where we see all these grand dam removal projects from the US and think, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to do that? But, you know, we've, in many cases, we've got hundreds and hundreds of years of infrastructure that's been built up around these things that we have to consider in our dam removal projects. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight, really, was the sort of more insidious problems we have as local trusts that, that you know, they're not glamorous dam removal projects. They're what I call the death by a thousand cuts. They are the small dams that you find in every day while you're walking up rivers and so on that no one ever knew was put in. No one can remember why. Um, a particular problem we have is with um, these, they're called, they have a lot of different local names, but they might be called a pipe bridge, they might be called an Irish dam, um, and, um, you know, they've obviously been put in for access. Um, and the minute you put them in for access, the gravel gets starved below, they turn it into a, an actual dam, and someone puts some more concrete on, they grow and they grow and they grow um, until they can't be accessed anymore. Um, and that's where we've really, you know, communities really come into their own, and, you know, they, these are in places where we don't need lots of permissions, and they've just been getting in and coming up with all sorts of different solutions um, to, uh, to getting them opened up again. And it's been amazing, incredible to see how, um, how these rivers have naturalised in, in very short spaces of time. So I just wanted to leave you really with, with this quote. Um, we use this a lot of our local trusts, um, just to say you know, that, that the work that our community groups do really do make a difference. Um, and um, you know, on a local level, they might feel quite isolated. They might feel that they're pushing water uphill. But when we start to bring all of this effort together across the country, it really is a small army of people doing work. And we just counted up the other day, you know, that when we counted up the expertise within our local trust, we realised that we, you know, just exceeded the number of technical specialists working on this kind of stuff in the NGO network that are working on it in the government agencies. But that's the scale of how it's grown. Um, you know, suddenly we are, a, you know, we're a force to be reckoned with, and I think that should be inspiration to people wherever they are. That you know, if you see problems in your rivers, you can get involved and you can do something. And there are ways out of ways out there to make what you do mean more by um, by making sure it's legitimised, by making sure people know what it is, and by using best practice and sharing that with others. So I just wanted to sort of show you a few of the, uh, the dams that we're hoping to remove in the next, just in the next three years. Um, this one's a particularly one of great interest to me because I, I live only the other side of those hills there. Um, and that's incredibly, that's a dam built across one of our biggest English lakes. 
um, to hold the water drop so that the water company can take more water. Um, we found a new solution for that water company. Um, and so we're going to be removing this dam, which is very exciting. And these three are going to be taken out thanks to European Maritime and Fisheries Fund money, um, which is, uh, I know, a source that you're using here in Finland too. So I look forward to hopefully coming back and seeing you again in the future and not having so many pictures of dams and having more pictures of naturalised rivers. And if you want to find out any more about what we do as the Rivers Trust or the catchment-based approach, which is the, the, um, uh, the work that we're doing to, to contribute to water framework directive, uh, then please do look at those websites. There's lots of technical information, particularly on the bottom one there, to, to help people in all sorts of areas, from citizen science, from uh, of water quality, right the way through to things like GIS and remote sensing and so on. So, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be, uh, I can take any questions now that you might have, but also I'm going to be in which group, really? Uh, group one. I'm going to be in group one in the workshop session, so if you'd like to ask some, some questions there too, I'll be very happy to take any. So thank you.